Isaiah chapter 33. Now, as we look in the book of Isaiah, I, I'm, I'm absolutely overwhelmed by the prophets of old and the prophets of the new. As we look at the revelation in the new of the epistles of Paul and Peter and James and John and Jude and Titus, in the book of James, we're, we're, we're amazed at the revelation knowledge that God had given to them. And yet in the old covenant, I'm amazed because the Bible says that the scripture came not by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. See, these men in the old covenant, they didn't come up with something of their own mind, their own reasoning, their own rationale, their own intellect, their own ideals, their own opinions. It was divinely inspired of God. It was quickened to their hearts supernaturally. God revealed himself to these men in such marvelous, awesome, amazing ways. I know a lot of people think the old covenant has no, no bearing today, but they're so wrong because he said, I am the Lord and I change not. And we can look at all of these men, whether it be Ezekiel or Habakkuk or Amos or, or any of these men in the Old Covenant, they were holy men. You know, you know what amazes me? How could men who still did not have the new nature, they were not born again, how could they live holy? How could they be so holy to where the Holy Spirit could just take them away? He could just reveal to them with signs and wonders and visions and dreams who he really was. That's, that's amazing to me. Now, if they could live holy in the old covenant, because the Bible says they were holy, then why can't we? Can't we live holy? Sure we can. Matter of fact, every epistle begins with the terminology saints to the saints in Ephesus, to the saints in Galatia, to, to the saints scattered abroad, saints separated, sanctified, set apart, consecrated, holy unto God, holy. See, that's an attribute of God that we don't hear much of anymore today, that he is a holy God. He is so holy. He is so holy. And all the angelic beings sing around the throne, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was, who is, and who is to come. He is a holy God. And he moves upon the hearts of his people. And he's trying to bring us into a place of holiness. Now Isaiah was a prophet who to me was extremely amazing because as you begin to read, there's so many prophetic descriptions of who Christ really is is and what he came to do and what he was going to do. Isaiah 53 alone about how he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes ye were healed. And then we see as Christ comes to the earth, born of a virgin, and he is upon that whipping post, and he receives those stripes upon his back for our healing, our freedom, our deliverance. Amazing. It's overwhelming to me. It's mind-boggling to think how awesome and how marvelous and how wonderful and how amazing this God is that came to this earth and took upon flesh and blood and he took my sins and he took my iniquities and he paid the price. He took my punishment. And Isaiah reveals this to in Isaiah 53, but also in Isaiah chapter 6, he said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. High and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And if you'd continue to read, he declares when he saw the Lord, he said, Woe unto me, woe unto me, a holy man, a man who was living within the divine ability of God. He said, Woe unto me, for I'm a man of unclean lips in the midst of unclean people. Isaiah had such a revelation. In Isaiah chapter 55, he says, As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts and your thoughts. And he's talking about the word of God, because he said that as the rain comes from the heaven, and the water comes, the rain comes, and so God's word, and it gives water to the seed, and the seed grows, and he says, so shall my word be, that it will not return void, but it will accomplish the thing whereunto I have sent it. Now we're looking in the book of Isaiah tonight, chapter 33, 
And at verse 10, God says something that is absolutely to me amazing. He says, now will I rise, saith the Lord. Now will I be exalted. Now will I lift up myself. Now if you continue to read, what he's talking about is the children of Israel have gone astray. They're living in sin and iniquity. They're worshiping false gods and false deities. And God says, I've had enough. I'm going to rise up. I'm going to deal with this. I'm going to change the situation. And then in verse 14, the prophet Isaiah says something that's quite amazing. He said, the sinners in Zion are afraid. <laughs> See, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. He said the sinners, now listen, not in the world, but in Zion. Zion is considered the house of God, the holy place, the habitation of the Lord. And he says sinners, and he's talking about the church, talking about believers. He's talking about the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, the, 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 the Israelites. They are filled with fear. They are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the, the hypocrites. Wow, why would he say hypocrites? Hypocrites are those who put on another face than that which they are. They're two different personalities. And he says, I have surprised the hypocrites. Why? Because they really thought they knew who good God was. I, I, I think that's, that's a major problem today is, a lot of people think they really, 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 really know God. We've convinced ourselves we know God. And that God's just a, just a man upstairs. He's just my buddy. He's just my friend. He's just, you know, my big brother. I heard someone tell me not too long ago, well, my big brother. No, no, he's Lord of Lords and King of Kings. He's Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. His flames, his eyes are like flames of fire and he's, he's, he's clothed in, 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 in a vesture of, of, of fire. And matter of fact, he says, who, listen to this question, and this is what I want to deal with tonight, who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? What do you mean dwell? Who can step into the reality of God is because he is a consuming fire. Deuteronomy 4 says that. Hebrews chapter 12 says that. Our God is a consuming fire. He is a fire. Now the amazing thing is, he said that he will make his ministers flames of fire. So God is a devouring fire, and the Israelites are discovering this. They discovered it way back when Moses took them out of the land of Egypt through the Red Sea, and he brought them to the Mount Sinai, and he went up to receive commandments, and all of a sudden fire began to descend. God descended, and fire came. Fire came. Over the tabernacle, a fire by night and a cloud by day, a divine fire, a consuming fire, a holy fire, a righteous fire. See, God is a consuming fire. Now, we could talk about fire and what it does, how it purges and clear, purifies and cleanses and how it melts, how it, how it changes things. You know, a, a lot of the, 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 the vehicles we drive today, almost everything we have had to be melted with fire to be formed and to be fashioned, to be shaped and to be molded and to be put into the shape or in the size and into the gears, into the, into the mechanics that we need for our engines and, 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 and for our cars and for our tools at work. A fire that melts and shapes. See, our God is a consuming fire. Now, who can dwell? He says, who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Now, listen, it says we will dwell. It doesn't say we will be consumed. It doesn't say we'll be devoured. And though the Bible says he is a devouring fire, and the fire goes before him and devours all that is against his will. He is coming back in flaming fire to take vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel. That's how Jesus is coming back. 
A lot of people misunderstand when Christ appears once again in the eastern sky, when he breaks open, he, he comes forth, he is coming, yes, on a white horse, but out of his mouth will come flames of fire to devour those who cannot dwell in this fire. Who can dwell in this fire? God's people is supposed to dwell in this fire. His men, his women, his servants, his sons, his daughters, those that are born again. Remember on the day of Pentecost, it said the Holy Ghost came like a rushing mighty wind. And what happened? A flame of fire appeared on top of their heads. They became flames of fire like the flame on the end of a candlestick as the wick burns and it draws the oil from the container that it is attached to. We are to be flames of fire. Who can dwell with God? Who is a devouring fire, a consuming fire, a raging fire, a holy fire, an amazing fire. That is God. That is his personality. You know, you may realize it because of the type of rays the sun puts out, but the sun itself is a ball of fire. All of the stars in the heavens are balls of fire, consuming, burning fire. I know the flames of a campfire are different than the flames of an arc water. Or even right now, the light that is being produced in this room, people may not realize it, but that is literally burning gases in, 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 in the fluorescent tubes. It is a fire. It is a fire. And so there is a fire. And God is a fire. And the prophet Isaiah says, who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? And then he answers this question in verse 5. And he gives to us six aspects in a person's life who can dwell, who can walk, who can move, who can live, who can flow, who can function in this fire. See, you understand when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the burning fire, it did not consume them. Why? Because they themselves were a fire. They were filled with the fire of God. And notice, it says six things. He that walketh righteously, number one. He that speaketh uprightly, number two. He that he he that despises the gain of oppressions, number three. He that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes, number four. He that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood, number five. And he that shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. Now, number six, see, these are the six elements that must be in my life. If I'm going to dwell, if I'm going to walk, if I'm going to move, if I'm going to flow, I believe these are the six elements that were in the lives of the early church. When the fire of God came upon those men who were in the upper room, these were elements that were in their life. See, I believe if these elements had not been in their life, when the Holy Ghost came in like a fire, like a raging, uh, uh, like, like a roaring wind, it would have devoured them. We read about that in the Old Covenant where they, were, they, they found Elijah, and, 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 and he said, if I be a prophet, let a fire come and devour you. And sure enough, a fire came and devoured them. And then another group came, and he said, if I be a prophet, let a fire come and devour you. And sure enough, they were devoured. And the third group came, but that man spoke up and said, oh, Elijah, don't, don't, don't. I, I, I hid the prophets uh, when, when the king and the queen were out to murder him. Don't let the fire fall on me. You know, sometimes we call for the fire of God. We're not ready for it. We're not walking in the reality of who God really is. You know, matter of fact, there's a scripture that's quite amazing to me because it says in Psalms 50 verse 21, These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such a one as thyself. But I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. He says, you thought I was altogether like you. 
J just a good old chip off the block, just a good buddy, just a, a brother, just a friend. No, no, I'm a consuming fire. I'm a devouring fire. And if you're going to dwell with me, if you're going to walk with me, if you're going to be one with me, you're going to have to meet the conditions. You're going to have to be like me. See, all of these conditions that the prophet spoke of, and then we can, if we have time, we can look at the benefits of it, but all of these things that the prophet spoke of was who God is. So the very first thing he says, number one, he that walketh righteously, he that lives righteously, he that does that which is right. The Bible says, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. First Peter says, be ye holy as I am holy. Now righteousness is not just a confession of your lips, a declaration that Jesus made me righteous. No, it is talking about a manifestation of living uprightly. Blessed is the man that does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. But his delights in the law of the Lord. So a holy man, a righteous man, an obedient man is someone who is walking in the character of God, the integrity of God, the nature of God. How do we do that, Pastor Mike? By the Holy Ghost. By the word of God. Remember it says in Ephesians, Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might cleanse it and wash it with the water of the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. So what we're talking about here is a purification, a holiness, an obedience, a righteousness that is not just of the confession of the mouth, but is produced and manifested in your flesh. You know, even when the devil came to God about Job and, and God said, have you considered Job because there's nobody like him in all the earth who, who, who loveth righteousness and excueth evil. You know, that's what we have to do. You know, why do you think the devil is propagating such a gospel, such a sloppy agape, such a greasy grace, such a you can live how you want and God still loves you. It, it, it's just so demon, demonic. And, and the reason why the devil is propagating a doctrine that you can live any way you want because then he knows the judgment of God, the wrath of God will come upon you. You know, it tells us there in Ephesians chapter 2, you had the quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins, where in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. See, we got to have a faith that produces obedience. I I'm telling you, Jesus told us that people who were destroyed when they brought them up, the Galileans, the people that the tower fell on, Shiloh, listen, he said, unless you repent, you'll likewise perish. What he's talking about is the fact that these men, these people were not living in the will of God. And if you're not living in the will of God, the Bible says this, if you're living in known sin, if you're purposely rebelling against God, it says the wrath of God is on you. Now, the good news is God's mercy. There's a time of mercy. There's a time of God's, really it's not mercy, it's long suffering and his kindness and his goodness that holds back his judgment. He really does not want to bring judgment, but he's got to have a holy people. So number one, if you and I are going to dwell in the burnings, in the devouring fire of who God is, we have got to walk righteously. Number two, he that speaketh uprightly. What does that mean? The Bible says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Jesus said, he told us over and over, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. If what is coming out of our mouth is evil, our heart is evil. If what's coming out of our mouth is good, then it is good fruit. The mouth gives you away. Death and life is in the power of the tongue, and they that love the fruit thereof partake of it. Jesus said, you will be judged according to what you say. Did you know that? Did you know Jesus said that every word that we speak, we will give an account of? Now that ought to 
make us shake and tremble. You say, yeah, but Pastor Mike, I, I, I don't know how to stop saying evil things. I, I don't know how to stop speaking wicked things. Well, what you got to do is you got to change the contents of your heart. See, your mouth or your words are like a bucket that is dipping within the well of your heart and is bringing, in, is bringing up whatever is in that well. Now, that bucket can't help it. If I lower a bucket into a well and that well is corrupted, polluted, contaminated, if there's sewage in it, if there's something dead in it, I will pull that poison up out of the bottom of that well and I will be giving it to people and it will have death. But if that water is sweet, if that water is drinkable, if it's good for you, then that's what you're going to be pulling up. And that's what it says. It says, who can dwell in the devouring fire? Who can dwell in the devouring flames of who God is? But he that speaketh uprightly, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. You know, it tells us in the book of James, talks about, and I just want to quote it, be not many masters, knowing that you shall receive the greater condemnation, for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle his whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm whithsoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body. Because you know what? We praise God, and then we curse men, which are made out of the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth comes blessings and cursings. My brethren, this thing ought not to be. Does a fountain send forth at the same place, sweet water and bitter? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries or a vine figs? So can no fountain produce sweet and bitter. Who is a wise man among you? And, and, and let him show out of a good conversation his works of meekness with wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom does not come from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. For where there is envy and strife, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by them that make peace. Now, I, I just quoted to you the whole, uh, 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 the whole chapter of, of, of the book of James, chapter 3. And the reason why I did that is because James had a revelation. He says, out of your heart the mouth speak. So if I've got bitter water, if I, I've got uh, strife in my heart, if I'm ugly, if I'm mean, if I'm rude, if I'm nasty, matter of fact, he told Tim he said, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If per adventure God will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. We're not going to set people free by being ugly, nasty, mean, by, by being having a, a, a quick temper, by having a short fuse, by being impatient. Listen, the people who will be able to dwell in the fire, who will be able to dwell in in the flames of God are those who speak what's right. They're living right and they're speaking right. They're speaking uprightly. So number three, he that despises the gain of oppressions. What, what does that mean? It, we're talking about robbery. We're, we're talking about people who are thieves. Remember the only time that Jesus ever really got upset was that when he went into the temple and the money changers and the buyers were there and they were selling and buying in the temple exorbitant prices. And Jesus got so upset that he turned over their tables, he grabbed a whip, he chased them all out, and he says, you have turned my father's house into a den of thieves and it's supposed to be a house of prayer. And, and that's one thing. It's not the fact that that we might have something that's available for people to buy, but we don't take advantage of them. We don't rip them off. We don't steal from them. We don't take 
from them by fraud. You know, the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. You know what? If you're in the ministry for money, you need to get out. You're in trouble. If you stand in the pulpit because you're getting paid and that's the only reason, you know, the Bible says that a hireling will flee. I, I, I'm telling you a lot of times, if money dries up in that local church, if money dries up in the ministry that God's put you in, and if you leave, I wonder what you were there for. No, no, no. He, who can walk in the flames? Who can walk in the fire? But someone who is not there because of financial gain. He is not ripping anybody off. He has not taken advantage of anybody. You know, there's a lot of, lot of carn artists today, and it told us that in the book of Jude, in the book of 2 Peter, it says in the last days this would happen, that there would be many who would, you, would make merchandise of, of, of the church, and, that's in the, and, and it also says that in Titus, and so there's a lot of people today, but they will not stand they would not be able to dwell. They would not be able to live in the flaming fire of who God really is. So the person who can dwells in the fire is one who despises the gain of oppressions. Number four, he that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes. What, what, what does that mean? That means you're not for sale. You, you can't be bought. You can't be persuaded you can't be moved because of somebody's money i remember years and years ago a man came to me who gave pretty good back in them days he was giving 500 dollars a week and I, I think that's pretty good and he came to me and he said uh, brother mike I, I i you know i just want you to know that uh, i like the church here and I, I i really like you but if if you don't stop preaching like you're preaching basically I, i'm taking my money and leaving that's what he said to me. He said, if you don't stop preaching away, and I'm telling you what, in the natural, it may look like we had really, really needed this money. And matter of fact, one time, I, I was literally leasing a car, and he, he uh, helped me get that lease. And, and I looked at him in the eyes with love and compassion, not with pride, not with anger, not with disgust. And I looked at him in the eyes, and I said to him, my brother, I am so sorry. I said, I can't do that. I said, I am going to preach the truth. I said, if you got to leave and take your money, then you have to go. And he did. Out the door he went. But you know what? That's okay. Because we're not in it for money. You can't bribe me with money. You can't buy me. I'm telling you all the silver, and I've already made up my mind. All the silver, all the gold, all the wealth of this world, you can have it. Because it doesn't move me. I know God will meet my needs. It's hard to explain to you. How in the world did we ever survive here as a church for almost 30 years when most times in the natural there wasn't hardly any money in, 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 in the offerings to cover the electric, to cover the heat, to cover the insurance, to cover the massive amount of bills that we had. God did it somehow. He's still doing it. He's still working miracles. He's still, we're in the midst of the, of the furnace, of the fire. See, this is a fire, and yet God still somehow keeps us going. It doesn't matter if people believe in us or not. It doesn't matter what people say. As long as you know, as long as you know, you're in the will of God. And so he tells us that holding of the bribes. And now listen to this, number five, that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood. Now, I, I think this is major importance. What do you mean, stopping your ears from hearing of blood? The Bible says, the Bible literally says that we are not even to speak of those things which are done to them in, 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 in darkness. I, I think this is, a, this is where the devil is getting a lot of ministers of God and a lot of Christians. We are looking at the shedding of blood. I know even on Facebook, people, Christians, are putting up videos of believers being martyred, of people dying. They're putting up videos and images of terrible, terrible crimes. I don't deny the crimes, but you know what? I'm not going to stop these crimes by looking at it. You know, years ago, I, I used to, you know, watch football a lot. And, and I'm not kidding. I'm just telling you what the Lord spoke to me. And one day I was watching football, watching these guys bust each other up. And this is what the Lord spoke to me. He said, the wicked love violence. 
I go, what? He said, the wicked love. I used to watch them box and beat the tarnation out of each other, punching each other in the face to the blood flowed, and, and the face swelled up. And the Lord spoke to me. He said, the wicked love violence. He said, son, that's displeasing to me. I said, what, Lord? He said, don't watch that stuff no more. Don't watch violent movies. Don't wic watch wicked stuff. See, if I'm going to walk in the fire of heaven, if I'm going to dwell in the devouring flames of God, then I have got to put away from my eyes. The Bible says that we are to put nothing wicked before our eyes. If I am going to do this, I've got to stop listening. I've got to, you know, a lot of times people like to listen to bad news. Oh, they're listening this and they're listening that. And you say, well, but Brother Mike, if we don't listen, how are we going to know how to pray? How are we going to know? Well, the Bible says, surely the Lord God will do nothing but he revealeth his secret to his servants, the prophets. When the lion roars, will not the people fear? When, when the Lord God has spoken, can we not but prophesy? So I want you to know something. If I'm going to dwell in the devouring fires of God, if I'm going to come through the fire and not be burnt, if I'm going to come through the flood and not be drowned, if I'm going to see a move of God in my heart, in my life, in this place, then I must turn my ears away from all violence. Not just violence. Turn your ears away from gossip. Turn your ears away from those that are speaking evil about your brothers. The Bible says, because he tells us, Speak not evil one of another, brother. For he that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother speaketh evil of the law and judges the law. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who art thou that judges another? So I've got to turn my ear. I've got to stop listening to violence and immorality and bloodshed and perversion. He says, who shall dwell in the devouring fire? Who shall dwell with the everlasting burnings? But who? They who walk righteously. They who speak uprightly. They that despise the gain of oppression. They that shaketh his hands from holding of bribes. And they that stop their ears from hearing of blood. And number six, he that shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. You know, I, I like what David said. David said, I have made a covenant with mine eyes that I will not look upon the maidens. Well, what did he mean by that? Of course, he messed up, didn't he? See, he had made a covenant. In his heart, I'm not going to look at the flesh of women. Now, if you're married, wonderful. The Bible says, delight yourself in the wife of your youth. But don't be looking at the flesh. Don't be looking at evil. Don't be looking at what's wrong. See, if you'll go back to the Garden of Eden, this is how the woman got herself in trouble. Because a snake came along and she listened to the snake. And then the Bible says she looked upon the fruit as to make one wise, and she partook of it. You got to watch your eye gate. The Bible says we got to be singly eyed, fixed on Jesus Christ. Our eyes belong to Jesus. Our ears belong to Jesus. Our mouth belongs to Jesus. Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost, and they belong to God. If I am going to walk with God, if I am going to be a consuming fire, if I am going to be one with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, I must take heed to what the prophet Isaiah said by the Spirit of God. And let me go over them very quickly once again until we see what the benefits are. He that walketh righteously will dwell in the devouring fire and with the everlasting burnings. He that speaketh uprightly, he that despises the gain of oppressions, he that shaketh his hands from the holding of bribes. I'm not taking it. You can't bribe me. You can't control me. You can't threaten me. You can't manipulate me through money. Praise God. Hallelujah. It says, and he that shutteth his eyes and he that turneth his ears away. You stop your ears from that of the hearing of blood. I'm telling you, I don't know how many times I began to hear people tell gory stories. And I put my fingers, you might say, in my ears. I walked away. I, I don't want to hear the gossip. I don't want to hear the backbiting. I don't want to hear the strife. I don't want to hear the putting down. I don't want to hear the evil report. I want to hear God. 
I've got to hear God. I've got to hear what God is saying. I've got to see what God is saying. And it says, number six, he that shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. I've got to shut my eyes. I can't look at what the devil is trying to show me. I dare not look at what the devil is trying to show me because the eye gate is the way into the heart. See, I did a teaching one time in the New Jerusalem. There's 12 gateways into the Jerusalem. Did you know that? And do you know in the old, in the old times that if you capture the gate, you capture the city. If the devil can capture any one of these 12 gates, your eye gate, your feeling gate, your mind gate, your mouth gate, your heart gate, your eye gate. If the devil can capture any one of these gates, your ear gates, you are a goner. He's got you exactly where he wants you. That's how he got David. He got him through the eye gate. You know, that's how he gets people through the ear gate. He gets people through their emotions, their feelings, their five senses. Touch, taste, smell, hear. The devil can get you through these gates if you don't watch it. So you got to turn your eyes away from evil. Now listen, those who do these things, verse 16, as we get ready to close, they shall dwell on high. <laughs> They'll live in the heavenlies. He said, yeah, but I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You're really not until you're walking in this realm. You're really not. You're still living on the mundane mud earth that we're on. See, you got to seek those things which are above where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth for you are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. And when Christ who is our life shall appear, you shall appear with him in glory. So those who are doing these six things, they shall dwell on high. The, the, listen, his place of defense shall be the munitions of ropes. Bread shall be given him. His water shall be sure. Verse 17. Now we could, we don't have time to get into all of that and what it means, but listen to this. Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. <laughs> you will see God. Remember, the pure in heart will see God. You will see God. A lot of people say, I, I just don't see God. I, I just don't see him in my life. I don't see him in my finances. I don't see him in my body. I don't see where he really cares about me. I tell you, I tell you why. Because you haven't met the condition. You, you haven't taken to heart what the prophet Isaiah said about those who can devour, those who can dwell in the devouring fire, and those who can live in the everlasting burnings. He said, thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. They shall behold the land that is far off. What does that mean? You're looking into heaven. <laughs> you're looking to eternity. You're looking across the Jordan River, and you're seeing the new Jerusalem. <laughs> you're seeing the gates appear, uh, appear pearls. You're seeing the streets of gold. Oh, they who do such things shall see God. You will see God if you do what the prophet Isaiah told us to do. Listen, verse 18, I love this. Thine heart shall meditate terror. What does that mean? Your heart's going to meditate terror. Oh, the fear of the Lord is going to be one of the most precious things to you because you understand how awesome, how mighty, how majestic, how terrible, how, 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 how amazing God is. Oh, if we would but do what the prophet Isaiah said. I, I like to really encourage you tonight as you've heard this message, as I preached it from the depths of my innermost being. I know if the Holy Ghost don't quicken it. I know if the Holy Spirit don't take it and use it. It ain't going to help you one iota. I just pray the Holy Ghost will take these words. I, I pray that you would see that we got to walk up rightly. I, I, I pray that you would see that all of these aspects of how we can walk with God. He is a consuming fire. He is a devouring fire. He is an everlasting burning. And I cannot walk with him. I, I, I cannot live with him. I cannot move with him. I cannot function with him. I cannot operate with him if I do not fulfill the conditions. And how do I fulfill these conditions? I do it by faith in Christ Jesus. I do it by the grace of God. I do it by the blood of Jesus. I do it by the empowerment, the enablement of the Holy Ghost. That's how we live in this realm. So I'd like to invite you. 
I'd like to invite all of you that want to live with God because we were made. He said, I will make them in my likeness and my image. And we need to walk in this consuming fire. We need to be flames of living fire. He said, it's not my word like a hammer that breaks the rocks and like a fire that consumes the stubble. We need to walk in these everlasting fires, these never-ending flames, these burnings that will never stop. And we've got to fulfill. How? 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 By faith. By faith. By faith. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Or he is a consuming fire. He is more than able. See, you understand, it says, sinners tremble in Zion. They're filled with fear. Why? Because these are people who name the name of Christ, but they've never fulfilled the covenant. See, in the covenant, whether people know this or not, it's a two-way street. There's never been a covenant that is one way. There's never been a covenant in all of history that I do this, do this, do this, do this, and you do nothing. That is bizarre. No one ever would sign a covenant like that. No, a covenant is a two-way street. I will do what I say if you do what I tell you to do. For in other words, the benefits, the promises, the blessings, the provisions. You say, well, that sounds like works. No, it is a works that is produced because you believe what God has said. I choose to believe what the Lord spoke through the prophet Isaiah. And I choose to walk with the devouring fire, with the burning everlasting fire, with the consuming fire, which is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, in Jesus' name.